Hello everyone, this is Ross Ratty and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk lots about fruits, all kinds of different vegetables, even the rare stuff, things you probably have never heard of, and then also how to grow that and how to prepare that in the kitchen and just interesting different things that are popping up on my YouTube channel, maybe something I've just learned that is really of great interest to me and my location. Um, in today's video, I want to focus on kind of what's going on in my kind of growing season because the spring is finally here. Uh, we live in Pennsylvania near Philadelphia, zone 7A. And I would say sometime around after daylight savings is normally the time that the ground starts to warm up. Um, it's really workable, right? It's not frozen. Um, the birds are chirping. The birds start to come back. You also get things growing that can can grow and, and handle the cooler soil temperatures. Things like alliums, um, they're going nuts. I mean, they're, they're actually putting on some decent growth. You know, temperatures are not really that extreme right now. We're seeing probably sometime, something around like 50 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. And then, you know, staying above 32 or hovering around 30 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Um, we're also seeing some things in like the 60s during the day or even the, the 70s we've seen. Um, and because we've seen these warm temperatures, like I said, things are growing, but also things are growing that I don't want to grow. Um, in particular, if you look here on uh, the YouTube channel, if you're watching this there, you guys can see some of the buds on a lot of my stone fruits. Even some pear trees have woken up and they're now actually pushing um, their buds, they're swelling, they're gonna about to flower. I um, mean, it's, you know, we still got a couple weeks before they're in full bloom here. Uh, but the, the more I can slow this whole process down, the better. We actually did a video on that quite recently. Um, so, you know, that's something that I'm really trying to hope and cross my fingers for this year is that we end up getting um, good stone fruit crops this year. This here is actually my garlic and the garlic is an unbelievable size this year. Uh, we did a little bit of a garlic experiment this year where we, we planted garlic in the fall because you, you have to plant it in the fall here. Uh, but also, if you live in more mild climates than where I do, right? Zero degrees Fahrenheit is normally what we get to. But if you live somewhere maybe where it only gets about 10 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Fahrenheit, you can probably grow garlic. You can plant that almost any time which is really cool. I mean, not any time, but at different times of the year, depending on the, um, the day length, right? So you can really kind of experiment with that, whereas I'm kind of set into planting them in the fall, harvesting them the next following season at like the early summer. And I believe, and I don't know how accurate this is, but the, the whole goal I wanted to do, I, and I need to read the book that I've picked up from uh, Ron L. Engelin, I think his name is. It's a, basically the, the premier book on growing garlic. And I haven't gotten around to finish it or even really get into it at all. But my theory is that if you get your garlic started earlier to, an early, to a bigger size, of course it's going to be a bigger bulb when you harvest it. Right? But here's the issue. When you get them to a larger size... Um, they're more susceptible to those cold temperatures, that cold damage that'll happen throughout your winter. But if you live in a, a mild enough area and the, the, the garlic plant is just small enough, it may actually be hardy and survive. And I've also experimented this year. You can't tell from this photo, but we put down lots of straw and lots of leaves. So the ground was really well mulched where the garlic was. And it, it really seems to collect mulch too. If the wind blows, the garlic really stops this stuff from blowing away and it collects around the garlic plant. So I really think that's part of it, but even though we got down to two degrees Fahrenheit here this year, my garlic had overwintered just fine. Even garlic that I had started August 15th, I think the one I think the garlic you're looking at right here was started August 15th. Now the normal planting and the planting date that's recommended for my area is, you know, sometime in early October. 
maybe mid-October. I've even seen people do November 1st. So uh, it really depends on the weather that year, what's going on. Also, I don't really know how this garlic's going to turn out, but I'm really liking the way it looks at current time. I think it's pretty interesting, and this was a great experiment that I'm, I was able to do this year. So I'm excited to see what's going to happen. You know, it could be a total flop, but who knows? Um, some other things that are going on in the garden, but also the orchard, is that we've turned on the heater in the greenhouse. We've woken up a lot of the dormant pomegranates in there. They actually wake up very quickly. Uh, I mean, you can put on that heater, you know, keep that those nighttime temperatures above 60. Those pomegranates wake up and they fully leaf out in what seems like only three days. It's crazy. Um, whereas my figs, they take about a week to maybe a week and a half to really start waking up. And it's a much slower process. We started the heater sometime around um, you know, March 5th, March 4th, something like that. We took the, uh, the tarp off of the top of the greenhouse to let that light come in and really heat it up during the day. That was after the 7th of March because we had a really nasty low on the 7th. And then we've just been there, been, you know, the heat's really been kicking on in there. Uh, it's been reaching easily 100 degrees in the di during the day. And because I kick the heater on at night and keep it above 60, the greenhouse really heats things up another 40, 50 degrees. It's actually incredible. So the greenhouse is going insane. Um, also, we put a lot of fig trees, guys, out on the patio. And... I kind of want to show you guys that. There's a video that we did very recently. If I can bring this up. It's a bit it's a bit of an experiment. My buddy Mario, last year this is what he did was he moved a lot of his dormant fig trees. Here's the video for anyone interested. My buddy. Um, basically he moved all his dormant fig trees out in the patio in sometime like early March. I think he even did it in February if I'm not mistaken. Uh, which is very early. But because he moved them out they easily transitioned out of dormancy and he was able to get a lot more time a quicker transition we don't really know why this is or what happened but if temperatures really stay above about 17 degrees Fahrenheit maybe even a little bit lower than that these fig trees are fine I mean if they're dormant and they're taking 17 degrees it's okay it really is um, a lot of varieties even the wood is gonna be hardy to, to 17 degrees um, the root zones of these plants is really what you have to kind of watch out for and 17 degrees seems to be that magic number you know maybe some varieties can take it a bit colder but uh, I don't know my in-ground trees by the way are doing fantastic we've moved a lot of things around we've knocked off the sides of my raised beds we've done a lot of planting in the last couple days I've got a lot of videos that are in the works that you guys probably are gonna see really soon um, we're actually at a point with the videos that a lot of the videos are not um, too far behind in time in terms of the date that they were filmed which is really nice um, I'm actually struggling a bit to get out some content but you can see some of the videos that are gonna come out soon we planted potatoes we are talking about how spring is here we're talking about the onions that we're planting also the alliums we talked about we talked about the carrots that are in the garden and we also planted lots of fig trees in the yard. We've moved a lot of fig trees around. These are dormant fig trees, not fig trees that um, are actively growing because it's just too cold here still to have an actively growing fig tree outdoors. It must be dormant. We are going to get some frost, I'm sure, between now and May 1st, which is our average last frost date. Um, I would say if we get to sometime around mid-April with no frost we're we're looking pretty we really are um, I'm actually kinda hoping there's a couple frosts coming up some things that are really gonna do some damage to just what's going on outside so that will kind of hopefully make it up so that you know maybe a month from now because we had that frost relatively soon it's gonna average itself out right it's gonna be just a bit warmer a month from now rather than a bit colder you know everything's the averages in my mind is you know it, it's pretty warm now or pretty mild now and most of the winter I think was pretty mild so 
I'm thinking maybe the spring is going to be also pretty mild and, and not as extreme as I'm hoping. But I'm also looking forward to the summer. I think it's going to be quite a dry summer just because of how much rain we've been getting. I'm hoping it's a dry summer. Um, and that will really be helpful for the figs as well as all the bricks and a lot of the fruits that I'm growing. Um, also, and I want to talk about this the most because this is really what's going on very recently, which is we are planting um, lots of seedlings. We have started lots of seedlings here. We started a whole playlist on YouTube, the 250 Days of Gardening playlist here. Uh, this is really starting from even in the fall when we talked about bed prep. We created some beds. We talked about how to do that. We talked about feeding the garden beds. Uh, we've talked about seed starting, what you guys will need. We also talked about planning, and this is also extremely important. I want to specifically talk about bed prep here for just a moment, but let's go talk about planning. And we've talked at great length about planning, even through Fruit Talk, if you guys have been listening for a long enough time now. We've mentioned this whole plan here that's in the spreadsheet. We've got a whole thing laid out, the exact spacing, the exact varieties. We know where everything's going to go. It's really, really simple this way. Um, and it just makes all that transplanting that I've done so far. Uh, today, actually, after work, yesterday, um, I believe on, on uh, was it sat? Was it, yeah. So Monday after work, today is Tuesday, by the way. We're filming the day before this video goes live. But um, yeah, both days after work, I got to really planting a lot of things in the ground. And I'm also going to be direct seeding a lot of things very soon. Um, I think it's actually warm enough. I'm not really going to wait until April 1st like I did last year. We're going to direct seed a lot of things. I'm going to plant a ton of peas. We're going to plant a ton of different cool loving crops that are really going to be beneficial this year for this time of the year. You know, this is really the time that you guys should be thinking about this stuff. We also need to tweak these garden plants just a tad and see what we can squeeze in. Um, I'm also getting to the point where I have so many things coming in and so many things that I'm deciding to grow that I'm kind of just sticking things wherever I can place them. And you know what? that's really not the end of the world either right it's better to have more dense planting I think more diversity than than not to um, so we've got lots of planting we direct seeded every we, we actually we seeded everything mostly in trays also in cow pots everything's doing really well between the cuttings the seeds we transplanted them we hardened them off we did all this stuff we also put a nice row cover over top Everything is looking great for the season. The one thing I want to talk about is, again, the bed prep. And the bed prep really is the most important thing when direct seeding, when transplanting. Um, growing vegetables is all about the bed. In fact, growing any fruit is all about the soil. It's really, really important. And I used to listen to people when I first started learning this hobby is that I would listen to them talk about the soil and how important it is and I just kept thinking yeah you keep saying that everybody keeps saying that but I don't really understand it well it really is important it's something you really should pay attention to you really should put that research in and figure out what works for you it's gonna be different depending on where you guys live it really is but overall you wanna have compost okay you wanna have some kind of well draining nutritious soil that can go on top of your soil that you can then direct seed into because compost is really great at holding moisture it's really great for starting seeds in and also transplanting things in. it's got lots of porosity it has lots of airflow especially if you add other amendments to it maybe you can add vermiculite if you really want to go that route you can add bark you can add rice holes a lot of these things make things uh, a lot more porous a lot more Air, um, you know, acceptable of more air, I should say. Um, well draining, you know, we don't want to be growing things in a swamp. If you got heavy clay soil like I do that holds a lot of water, it's really not a good idea to be planting vegetables or even seeds into that. They just will not do nearly as well. If the air is really, really important, that can penetrate it through the soil and get to those roots. It's kind of like 
they're kind of growing in a, a swamp. You know, everything's real heavy, real wet. Um, it's not it's not what we want. So it really does start at the soil level. And here's actually some beds that we've created. Uh, these are the raised beds that we took off the sides, spread the soil out, made this look more natural. We planted in some raspberries in here, some blackberries in here. We're going to plant some figs along here. Um, you name it, we're going to do it. Here's another one here. And we're also going to have, we have lots of figs planted out in this bed. But if I wanted to, I could actually grow a pretty decent amount of vegetables in this bed. But I think what I'll do is this year is we're going to plant some strawberries all up in these, all up in this particular bed. In the other bed here, this is all for the trailing blackberries that I'm going to experiment with. It's called the Marionberry. It's way better than any blackberry apparently. The problem with it is that it's not really hardy to my zone. So you really need a, a warmer zone 7 or a zone 8 climate. Otherwise you have to put the canes back down to the ground every year and then cover them with straw or mulch and that way they will uh, be insulated and I don't mind doing that uh, if it's tasty. If it's better than a triple crown or better than a Primark Freedom Blackberry then I'm in, right? Also, the way that I want to grow these things, I don't want these huge blackberry plants. I, you know, those are like 9, 10 feet, 12 feet tall some of them have gotten. So it's really important to, I think, look to other, other things here. And I don't mind the trailing aspect of them because when they trail along this bed, I can really contain them. And I can also then plant some things along the side of the bed that are going to then take up that vertical space. So I'm really excited to see what's going to happen this year. I have to change some orders around. I ordered some blackberry plants and some raspberry plants. We're going to go a different, a little slightly different direction um, and stick with the things I kind of just mentioned. Um, we also have this bed here. And check out those, the, those are the trays of seedlings here that I'm talking about that look beautiful. I was just amazed we didn't harden them off as nicely as I wanted um, some of that took a little bit of sun damage it's okay though also when we took a lot of those cells out of the tray it was quite difficult um, some of it didn't really root itself very well in those individual cells some of it probably needed a little bit longer uh, but you know what it doesn't matter because a lot of this stuff's so young that Transplanting young seedlings like this really doesn't, um, it really isn't going to put these plants far back, right? They're really adaptable at this point. Um, so, but here's another bed that, that I'm mentioning here that we're going to be planting a lot of fig trees in, an experimental orchard, see what's hardy, see what survives, see what actually is rain resistant, and see what's early. And... You know, if something good comes out of this, we're going to plant probably somewhere around 26, I'm guessing, fig trees in this bed here. It's going to go even further back, I believe. So we'll see what happens this year um, with that. But I think the end goal this time next year is to really have a production of fig trees in the ground that I can sell locally. Uh, to restaurants, we're going to be selling to restaurants, we're going to be selling maybe to grocery stores. Uh, just have a, a really high level of production that I can start to get somewhat of a following, somewhat of a client list that when eventually I do have my own orchard with my own backyard, I can then, um, you know, of course do this how I want to do it, but now start to get an even greater following when I know when that happens and really crank up the volume crank up the quality uh, of those figs and just go absolutely nuts so yeah I'm really excited for this whole season um, I'm really happy how everything's going you know I hope that uh, kind of cleared up a lot of every you know things that some questions I were getting you know what am I doing this time of year I think that's really what I wanted this video to be about um, you know, I also have a question here that I need to get to mentioning. I need to answer this one. So we have did this in the past where we answered a lot of questions in episodes of Fruit Talk and then went into great detail as to why, you know, what the answer was to those questions. And we haven't done that in a while, I think, because we've got a lot of content that was able to come out. 
which I'm very happy of or happy about. But uh, now I think we're going to rely on some questions and and really things that's that's kind of going on in the garden or in the orchard as we go along through the season. Um, but this guy here, Zorok, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce his name, but um, this guy here asked me a really great question and he really did provoke some thought. Um, it's about my tomato seedlings and when I've started them, why I started them all so early. Uh, essentially, he's saying that I've started them too early and that if you research the timing on when to start tomato seeds, you will find that most sources agree on eight weeks prior to the frost-free date or the last frost. Uh, longer than that is not beneficial. Uh, he also mentions Bill Merrill, who also has a YouTube channel here, and how I listen to Bill actually quite often. Um, I love his videos, and Bill has way more experience than I do. And Bill has mentioned some, you know, university studies or university um, information that basically says that starting your tomatoes or even starting seeds too early is not beneficial. And here's where I think a lot of what I'm saying about the tomato seedlings, because it's not just this guy that's sort of disagreeing with my methods of starting seeds, uh, at least in terms of the tomatoes. I think the tomatoes really are the only thing I've started early. To be honest with you, um, everything else has really not gotten as big as I think I would have. I would have hoped, in fact. Um, a lot of the cool loving crops, like I said, I think I wish they were a bit bigger, had shown their true leaves a bit more than they did. Um, you know, we started onions around the same time we started the tomatoes, but the onions need to be started that early. You know, that wasn't too early for. That was like something everybody says, all right, you got to start them like three weeks, three months, I'm sorry, before your last frost. Um, so really the big issue here is with the tomatoes. And, uh, you know, it really depends on your lights. It depends on your indoor environment. It depends on a lot uh, of technique. It depends on many things that and this is kind of what we talked about, I think it was last week when we talked about the garden myths, is that you can't apply the same principle for every single person. You just can't do that. Everyone has a different situation, and I don't really like to give you guys, I like to just tell you guys what I'm doing. You know, here's what I'm doing. You can follow me and follow along if you want, but you don't have to, right? I know a lot of you guys live in totally different climates than I do, yet you still listen to what I have to say. And for me to tell you guys some blanket gardening advice, blanket statements about anything related to gardening, a general statement about gardening, it's just not going to be true for everybody. And in the case of this particular topic, uh, the whole reason I think this is, is largely inaccurate for me is that, yes, they've gotten some great size. So I'm going to actually get them for you right now. I'm going to show them to you. So here's one right here. You can see how big this is. I would say this pot is probably somewhere around seven inches tall. Um, I think it's about seven inches. And then we've got the, the tomato plant itself, which is another seven inches taller than the pot. So what we originally did was we planted these tomato plants in three inch by three inch cow pots. Uh, they're kind of like peat. Uh, peat pots that degrade in the soil and they'll break down and the roots will grow through those pots. And that's a great size I think to really start things in and get get larger plants if you wanted to go that route, right? Now what I wanted to do even even further was take the cow pot, that three inch by three inch pot, and stick it into one of these grow bags, even in a larger pot. And that's exactly what I've done. This is now a half gallon size pot that we've got this in. And it's getting even larger. We still have roughly about two months to a month and a half in, uh, in amount of time until these guys will legitimately go outside and be transplanted in the ground. So we've got plenty of time still. So these things really have been quite vigorous. And I would agree with you guys that in a way, these things were started very early. But 
it's not very early for this size plant, right? If I plant this size anything in the ground and the soil temperature is warm enough, that's very key, this thing's gonna go nuts, okay? I don't care what the university say because I know that if I transplant something this strong of a root system, it's gonna go berserk, all right? And I got the right, I got the right temperatures, I got the right metabolisms, you know, they're gonna transplant just fine, okay? Now, some of you guys have been worried, well, they're gonna get lanky, right? Well, they did get lanky, so what we did was we buried them and we got the, the stem of these tomato plants planted deeper. So now they're growing roots all along the stem of the tomato plant. Now here's the other catch that no one seems to really understand when they're telling me that I've started them too early, is that I'm not planting these the same way that you're gonna plant them. I'm planting them on a trench. I'm planting them sideways. And then this part of the, the tomato plant will actually stick up towards the air, and this will be the single stem tomato plant that I grow. I don't even grow tomato plants like everybody else. Most people grow them as a bush. They let them bush out and do their crazy thing. That's largely just not beneficial, especially in my area, okay? I have seen these tomato plants grown as single stem plants way outperform, especially for the amount of space that they're in. Any tomato plant that you just let it bush out, you put it in a tomato cage, uh, literally it is far superior for disease, for airflow. Uh, they're more productive per square foot, way more productive per square foot. And I get a crop late in the season that most people are not getting. I was getting beefsteak tomatoes 15 days before my first frost. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. I, I can't, I don't get it why why not every single person is growing their tomato plants as a single stem plant vertically. It just, it just doesn't make sense. And I've tried to do many videos on this topic and I know that this guy here has actually probably seen that video. So, I mean, I don't know if you've tried it, but you should. And that's kind of the point I wanted to make with these tomato plants is that I'm not doing this by the books, right? I'm, I'm not doing this the way that they say you should grow tomatoes. So therefore, if I'm not doing this the way that they have expected me to do this, then all the other data related to this is going to be inaccurate, right? Um, I can pretty much do whatever it is I want to do, right? First off, of course, this is my garden, right? Anyone can do whatever they want to do, right? There's obviously there's freedom. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to bring that point up, but the point I'm trying to make is that gardening is very flexible, right? And just because the books are all saying do it not this way doesn't mean I shouldn't do it this way. So I want everybody to kind of understand that. And I think if there's any single thing that I've learned throughout gardening, it, this is the most important thing that I'm trying to convey to all of you, really. Uh, this, is, this is the number one thing, and I, I'm glad it keeps coming up, and I'm going to keep mentioning it to everybody, because this is like the, kind of like the new thing that I've had like a nice little epiphany about, well, maybe not too new, but... Um, it's really made this hobby interesting. What makes this hobby interesting is that there's a there's a many many different ways to do the same thing, and you don't have to do it the way that everybody says you should do it, right? You can try something totally different one year and come up with a totally different response, right? That's the beauty with this. That's the beauty with growing plants is that we don't know everything about plants. We don't. I mean, we know a lot about plants, but we don't know exactly how everything's going to work, right? We don't know what the optimal way is to do every single thing. There's always something new out there. There's always something better. Um, there's always a new variety. There's always this. There's always that. It's like, it's such a beautiful hobby for that purpose, for that reason. 
And I want to encourage you guys to understand that, but also to do it, to try it. Try something new. Experiment in your garden this year. Um, and hopefully that kind of, uh, you know, answers this guy's question and answers the question for that other people have been having the same thing, right? In terms of uh, university studies, you know, stating that um, plants that are, are smaller in size transplant better, I totally agree. I have no doubt about that in my mind. There's no doubt. I mean, and, and all the plants that I have transplanted to date have been quite small. But these tomato plants, the peppers, the eggplants, these are things that need a longer season. Um, these are the things that I want to have a lot of, and I want to have them earlier in the season, right? I think there's also another point that I think Bill mentions and what these universities are mentioning is that if I transplant this tomato plant with fruit on it, it's not going to transplant very well. And that's true. Why, why would I leave fruit on this? I want this to grow strong and healthy. I want this thing, when I transplant this sideways in a trench, I want that thing to grow roots all along the stem and really just go nuts from there, right? So I'd be interested to see, of course, how this is all going to work out. I'm sure you guys are interested to see too. You know, I'm not guaranteeing that this is going to be a, the best way to do it, but this is something that I wanted to try this year, and I really wanted to have the largest eggplants, peppers, and tomato plants that I could get a hold of, so that by the time the the summer or the, the early spring comes around, I transplant these things in the ground, and uh, we're looking at you know, huge yields sometime in like, probably sometime in, in uh, early June, maybe even mid-June, or maybe even, probably not early June, probably sometime around mid to late June. I would love to have tomatoes and, and things like that that early. It's really difficult to do. I know a lot of that stuff takes probably till about August in my area for it to really start doing anything and it really is a bit of a disappointment because you've got all this time of your season where these things are not doing really much and I know a lot of that has to do with the soil temperature also these the plants are quite young so anything I really can do to kind of speed this process up maybe if I can get these things to fruit by July 1st I'll be so happy I mean that would be that'd be great that's a whole month earlier than what I had last year. So, yeah, that's this episode of Fruit Talk, guys. I hope this one was informative. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you got this far, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Check us out there. It's at Ross Ratty. Also, check out the new website, rossratty.wixsite.com slash blog. We have a nice blog post that's very different than the podcast, very different from the videos. Also, we have a nice little consulting page there. So if anyone's interested in consulting work, um, also, if you guys are interested and want to support my work, please subscribe on Patreon. Follow me on Patreon. Support me there. Anything is really, really great. Also, we do have some plants that are going to be on FigBid very, very soon. Um, some of them are already listed. We have raspberry plants for sale um, that I've dug up recently. We bare-rooted them, and they're ready to be shipped. Um, these are really, really productive, tasty raspberries, heritage Caroline we have for sale and also another another uh, raspberry variety called double gold we're gonna have actually a couple varieties of figs for sale very soon just cuttings and then also very soon we're gonna be starting selling trees so if anyone's interested in buying some real interesting varieties of figs that's gonna be up there uh, I expect the cuttings probably to be listed tomorrow when this video does go live so if you're interested in the cuttings it probably will be up here on FigBid, ready to go. Um, yeah, so if anyone has supported me through buying any of the plants or cuttings that I've sold, I also greatly appreciate that. I really appreciate all the viewers out there. Comment down below, guys. Like this one. So, you know, Share the, the podcast with people that haven't heard this just yet. Um, I think this is a really interesting topic for people that are foodies. If anyone out there really loves food, that's kind of what the demographic is that I want to make this podcast cater to. So um, anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching again. 
Take care. We'll catch you for next week's episode of Fruit Talk. Ross Raddy out.